Welcome to Unpacked with Jack. I am Jack today. I will be filling the role of Jack because I bought a PlayStation 4 and I asked for the privilege to unbox it myself rather than having someone else do it, which is exactly how this went down. I asked for the privilege. Nobody is forcing me to do this. So this is it, the PlayStation 4, the first of the next-gen consoles, because of course the Wii U does not necessarily count, if you want to call next-gen in terms of next-gen hardware and performance. It is a dramatic improvement over the PS3 and the Xbox 360 in terms of the actual graphical fidelity that it can produce. In fact, most of your games will run at 1080p now, which is definitely very cool. Alright, so it comes in jet black. This is one of the only things on the front of the box, along with a PS4 logo, a Sony logo. The fact that it has a 500 gig hard drive by default, which can be upgraded, and this little sort of confusing note, the vertical stand is evidently sold separately in spite of the fact that it is pictured on the front of the box. It wouldn't be the first time that anything confusing was on the front of a box. Here they have some things that make sense, such as game characters, we got some Assassin's Creed and other good stuff like that, and there's two PlayStations, which of course are not included, but they do have some information about their Vita streaming. So you can actually game on your PS Vita, you can stream from the PlayStation 4 to the Vita, you can evidently also watch movies and do cool stuff like that over your wireless 802.11n non 5 gigahertz connection. More on that in a little while. It comes in at $399.99, so that is $100 cheaper than the Xbox One. However, it doesn't come with the PlayStation camera. You have to add that for 60 bucks. Then your vertical stand probably costs a few bucks, so you gotta add one of those too, and all of a sudden we're saving you know, like $20 over an Xbox One. But the good news is that you can probably get a case of like Mountain Dew for 20 bucks. So there you go. You can get your PS4 and enough fuel to play with it for like the next 48 hours straight. So yeah, that's, that's a lot better than Xbox One. All right, so on, inside the outer sleeve, we find exactly the same bloody box. I don't know why manufacturers even bother doing this. We find another seal to break and the box is now open. This won't be the first unboxing of the PS4 on YouTube, but it'll definitely be one of the ones with, uh, you know, a glorious PC gaming master race sort of slant to it because I think most of those folks aren't buying PS4s. In fact, the reason I'm buying it is so that I can do some image quality comparisons between PlayStation 4 and a mid-range gaming PC and some of the cross-platform titles like Battlefield 4. So the first thing we find inside is, hey, try PlayStation Plus free for 30 days. That's, uh, that's just like the fee I already pay to my internet service provider every month, except that I can pay more to play my online games. Most PC games don't have that, by the way. You can just play them. Uh, although there's other, stuff, there's other stuff on PlayStation Plus, and the good news is that unlike Xbox One, most of the services that you want to access on PlayStation 4 are accessible without PlayStation Plus, okay? So it's not like Xbox One where it's like, yeah, you want to play multiplayer games at all, you're going to need this. You want to have any access to the functionality of your console, yeah, you're going to need your Xbox Live Gold membership. Next up inside, we have an HDMI cable. All right, HDMI, that's a next generation interface. It probably supports, you know, 4K at 60 frames per second. I mean, it's not like the hardware can handle 4K at 60 frames per second anyway, so don't worry too much about it. We've also got a power cord, so it should be noted. This is actually really cool. PlayStation 4 does not have an external power brick, so you don't have to find somewhere to manage that stupid thing, which is actually legitimately fantastic. I like that. Clean cable management, wall-mounted TVs. That is the present, if not the future, my friends, so I'm glad to see it. We've also got a USB to mini, or rather micro B connector, so that is for charging the DualShock 4 controller. So the DualShock 4 controller is an evolutionary step forward. I've heard it compared more to the Xbox 360 controller. I'm not sure I quite see the resemblance. To me, it does look an awful lot more like a DualShock, and it does feel an awful lot like a DualShock. I think we've already seen a lot of talk about this, so I'm not going to get into it too much, but of course you've got the usual two clickable joysticks, the D-pad, which I, I like the PlayStation approach to the D-pad with the discrete buttons as opposed to having the filled-in middle, as well as ABXY, I mean um, X square circle triangle because that's the PlayStation way. You've also got start and select but they are renamed share and options as well as your shoulder buttons and trigger buttons, an LED with 
an LED light in the front that's actually color changing depending on which character you are, and finally, a touchscreen and a speaker as well as a PlayStation button. So the touchscreen's actually kind of cool. It has an integrated clicky button, and you can use it for things like the integrated game. You can evidently, according to late night television, throw robots around and then have iced tea kick them and stuff. So that's, that seems useful. You've also got a headphone jack built right into the controller, and it comes with a little you know, earbud slash microphone piece, which is like the cheapest thing I've ever seen in my life. And you're probably gonna wanna replace that with something else to have a halfway decent gaming experience. So on to the PS4 itself. It's a little bit smaller than the Xbox One. It has a very angular shape to it that is not at all reminiscent of a VCR. In fact, compared to most VCRs, which had flat fronts to accommodate the tapes that had to be inserted to them, this one has an angled flat front. So a VHS tape would not fit very comfortably inside this one. It weighs about nine pounds and can be stood up vertically if you buy the uh, <clears throat> vertical stand, or it could just be stood up vertically because the thing is basically like square anyway, so I really don't understand why you would do that. On the front, we've got two USB 3.0 ports as well as a Blu-ray drive. That's a 6X Blu-ray drive. Two USB 3 ports is great because it will allow you to expand on some of the functionality that just plain isn't built into the unit itself like 802.11 AC or even 5 gigahertz 802.11 N, which in my mind, if you're gonna use the Vita streaming service, is going to be essential if you're not living out in the middle of nowhere with like cows in your living room where there are no other wireless hotspots around you. 2.4 gigahertz is so congested in places like apartments, you will be lucky to have any kind of link to your console, never mind being actually able to stream games at any kind of reasonable resolution to a handheld console. On the back, we have the rear I.O., which is taken up by a number of things. So first up is optical audio out. Love to see this because some people have older receivers where HDMI audio is not supported. We've also got HDMI, Ethernet, as well as an auxiliary connector for the PlayStation camera port. Finally, there is a power input. Wouldn't have minded seeing some USB ports on the back just for a little bit more expansion because most PCs do have that because people do like to plug things into these things and not necessarily have them sticking out the front of their console. Again, it's that clean look. It's the kind of thing I would have expected Sony to think of. The LED strip glows amber in standby, by the way, but while you power it on, it is blue. All right, so we fired this bad boy up. The touch sensitive button on the front is easy to accidentally press when you're in the middle of doing an unboxing, but I suspect that won't happen too much when you're actually using the device and it's like, far away from you because this is like wireless Bluetooth. Bluetooth 2.1 no less. It's like they're determined to be last generation. All right, so the LED strip on the side glows amber in standby, white when powered on and blue when powering up. So you can see we have it powered on right now. It's actually quite quiet. So I'm wearing a lav mic. I'm putting the exhaust right next to it. That's pretty damn nice considering that it's not doing anything, but that it's not gonna make noise just when it's idling. Now, hardware-wise, let's talk the hardware. This is my specialty. It has an eight core processor inside. These are AMD Jaguar cores, which to put, to be clear, guys, are nothing special. These aren't fantastic CPU cores or anything like that. The fact that it's eight core and someone's, you know, Core i7 Extreme Edition gaming PC is only six cores, does not mean that this is somehow better. But because of some of the things that AMD He's been doing with their Mantle API as well as working with game developers of uh on, as well as working with game developers to optimize for multi-threading goes, this could still deliver enough power for a very compelling gaming experience, especially now that we're seeing some of the differences that Mantle's gonna make on the CPU side on the PC. So AMD has actually shown off taking an eight core processor from their own lineup that's clocked at like four gigahertz, cutting the clock speed in half, and showing that even with a high-end PC graphics card, which is of course much more powerful than the GPU in here, there is no performance degradation. Speaking of the GPU in here, it is a 1.84 teraflop. That's all the real specs they're giving us. GCN architecture GPU. So what's interesting about that is that on the PC, AMD's got their Mantle API, which is not to be clear the same API that's going to run on PS4 or Xbox One or anything like that. But what we have heard from DICE already is that the Mantle code is a lot more similar 
to the code for Xbox One and PS4 than it is to DirectX code. So what that means is we could be looking at much easier porting of games between consoles and between PCs this generation compared to ever before. This is extremely exciting because in the past, console optimizations have allowed their vastly inferior hardware to be competitive with PC hardware in a way that I really don't think is going to be possible in the future. So this console is figured, we're estimating it's gonna be around for about 10 years, we could be looking at a much bigger disparity in the performance between PC and console by the end of this generation. RAM wise, it has eight gigs of RAM, which is about what a respectable gaming PC would have today. But the cool thing about that RAM is that it's actually accessible to both the CPU and the GPU, which is incredibly cool. So game developers can decide exactly how they want to allocate those resources. So this is, again, console optimizations, being able to program specifically for a piece of hardware as opposed to having to deal with an intermediary layer like DirectX. There is no infrared um, receiver or blaster, so the Xbox One does have that. I personally see that as a pretty major selling point because as much as gamers are upset about Xbox One being presented to them as an entertainment system and not having the same raw GPU performance as PS4, it is pretty darn handy to be have an infrared blaster and being able to, you know, PVR shows and do stuff like that. So I do see that as a selling point, even if not everyone cares about that. I mean, for a box that's $400, give me as much functionality as you possibly can. So I think that's pretty much it, guys. Thank you for checking out our unboxing and overview of the PlayStation 4. Don't forget to subscribe to NCIX Tech Tips for more Unpacked with Jack episodes that probably won't have me for the most part because I was, uh, contrary to what I said at the beginning, I was threatened. I was threatened into making this. No, don't hit me. Ah!